right, so now we'll turn it over to my colleague uh, to take us through the data that we have for reversal. Okay, so the definition of a major bleed. There have been a few uh, classification scales, but it's certainly the, the most broadly used is the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis, which sees major bleeding as bleeding in, in a critical organ, obviously intracranial hemorrhage, intracerebral hemorrhage, intraspinal, intraocular, uh, potentially intraarticular and, and retroperitoneal, but also there's for the GI bleeds and the, and the bleeds that you can't see, the non-visible bleeds, you look at hemoglobin drops, which are not ideal, but you don't really have anything else to quantify when a patient with a GI bleed comes in. It's much harder to, to, to measure the bleeding any other way. And of course, if, if the bleeding kills you, that would be a major bleed. <clears throat> so when do you consider using a reversal agent? I think the paradigm has shifted a bit since the days of uh, warfarin was the only option, so the five decades or so that that was true, or seven. Um, so I think ICH, intracranial hemorrhage, intracerebral hemorrhage, is always a major bleed because the mortality is so, the consequences are so, are so high of bleeding in such a confined space and herniation syndromes and, um, and neurologic devastation that happens when you have hematoma expansion in, in that tiny space where a little bit of blood has a really big consequence. Uh, for the other end of the sort of ISTH defined major bleeding, the, the, the GI bleeds that may drop two grams of hemoglobin, but say over several hours or, or a day. I think in the age of the DOACs, which have shorter half lives and certainly in the setting of normal kidneys are eliminated fairly quickly, those are, are patients who may be less likely to be reaching for a reversal agent. Um, I think if you define major bleeding as the, the top half of the ISTH defined, which is about half ICH and the other half are mostly GI bleeds and shock. Those are the ones where, uh, in the in the setting of DOAC, we really should be looking for a reversal agent to uh, to pull them back from the brink. So, when to consider using a reversal agent? Certainly, if you need to take them directly to the OR, uh, if, you, if there's some sort of intervention, uh, neurosurgical intervention, you would want to have a normal hemostatic mechanism, uh, and in patients who are at high risk of having a hemorrhagic death. So times not to consider reversal would certainly be elective elective procedures. Uh, gastrointestinal bleeds that maybe you just have to give a unit of tour blood and they, they're not, they're, they're, you know, their vital signs are okay, or maybe a little tachycardic but not shocky. Uh, and certainly in patients, regardless of how much anticoagulant they have on board who are not bleeding, then uh, observation would be appropriate. Um, and any any time you had a patient on a, on a direct oral anticoagulant in which the surgical procedure could be delayed for a day or two. I don't see any reason to get aggressive with a reversal agent. <clears throat> so in summary, uh, specifically major bleeding is one of the uh, major barriers to effective anticoagulant use. And that, that's a pretty big deal. The, the data, and maybe it's improving now in the age of DOACs, I haven't seen any big uh, registry looks at just how what percentage of for instance, AFib patients are with CHAD scores of two or greater, meaning they, by guidelines, qualify for an anticoagulant, actually are anticoagulated. And a, a, a few years ago, that it was about half. Uh, and if you, if you do a little back of the napkin calculations, if only half the people with AFib or who should be anticoagulated are, uh, it represents a couple of hundred thousand unnecessary strokes a year. So that's a huge, potentially preventable burden of thromboembolic disease. Uh, major bleeding, once it happens, uh, it's, it's fairly rare and it's even, it appears to be even rare, at least the most devastating kind seems to be rare with these newer drugs. It carries a high mortality once you have it. So you may be less likely to get the ICH with the DOAX, but once you get it, your mortality is still uh, close to 50%. Uh, anti 10 a assays are the most reliable way to assess anticoagulant activity in the factor 10 a inhibitors but they're not readily available at the bedside. And we really, uh, there's a lot of uh, talk and, and I think a lot of work going on about getting these tests to the bedside, but we're not there yet. So we have to use time basically as a surrogate. And we're used to doing that in the stroke world because that's how we decide when to get TPA, right, for acute stroke. Uh, so we kind of use time in the setting of a factor 10A inhibitor. Did they take it in the last day? 
And then we can use these qualitative sort of tests, remember oxyban is the PT a little elevated. Um, and for dabigatrin, if you don't have the thrombin time, you could look at the PTT. And then you have to make a decision, is this, a, a, is this bleeding patient, uh, is the anticoagulant contributing to this bleeding scenario, or are they just bleeding because you know people bleed without anticoagulants? So and then you make the decision whether to use the reversal agent and how, how uh, aggressive to get about that. Certainly life-threatening bleeding. Patients who are about to bleed to death in a traumatic setting, uh, or patients with an intracerebral hemorrhage, high risk of death, uh, and patients with uncontrollable hemorrhage. Those are ones we're reaching for a reversal agent, and certainly the stable sort of GI bleeds or the slow bleeds, or, and you can you know, name five or six other anatomical sites that we see in the ER that bleed occasionally, the nose, the urine. Uh, as long as they're not hemodynamically unstable, I, I don't think you should be re reaching for the reversal agent. So incorporating these new, new treatments, we can go over some of the evidence that got us here. I think there were, there were lots of reasons uh, for doing a single cohort trial when it came to uh, evaluating the DOAC reversal agents. And here I'm talking about adiricizumab, the monoclonal antibody for dabigatrin, and indexinate alpha, the modified sort of decoy factor 10A that uh, was used for the, for the 10A inhibitor reversal agent. So it would be wonderful if we could do placebo-controlled randomized trials, blinded on everything, but it's really hard to talk, and myself included, a clinician into giving a placebo to a patient who's bleeding to death. Uh, that was just a non-starter. And even today, there's a lot of um, debate about which agent to use off-label uh, in treating DOAC-related bleeds if the specific approved FDA-approved reversal agents aren't available, like dericizumab for dabigatrin, and only for dabigatrin. It's a monoclonal antibody. It doesn't work on anything else. And then the indexinate alpha, which which uh, is a reversal agent for the entire class of factor 10A inhibitors. So what are, what are the parameters we look for in bleeding studies? Well, we would like our patients not to die. That would be a victory. Uh, we don't want them to be in the ICU a long time. And, and when we're studying ICH patients, a good surrogate outcome for the first one there, dying, is uh, hematoma expansion. It's a, it's a great has a great correlation with 30-day mortality. If the, if the hematoma is getting bigger in that first 24 hours, that, that portends bad things happening to the patient. Uh, hemoglobin status for bleeds that you can't see, and then resource utilization. We would like to not have to keep giving red blood cells to a bleeding patient if, our, in fact, our reversal agent is working. So the mechanisms, um, as I mentioned before, for the two reversal agents, for the two classes of direct oral anticoagulants, being the direct thrombin inhibitors, dabigatrin, uh, has praxbind, idariucizumab, the monoclonal antibody to the drug dabigatrin, and the 10A inhibitors, all cleverly named with the word XA ban or 10A ban, and in the words themselves, I tell my residents that if you see that on the end of it, it's probably an anticoagulant and it's probably a 10A inhibitor. So 10A band drugs all have indexes, their reversal agent, uh, which is a cleverly designed molecule. So it's a, it's a recombinant factor 10 molecule with the serine end, the, uh, that's the active site that cleaves prothrombin to thrombin. It's been replaced with an alanine, so that's inert. It won't uh, catalyze the prothrombin to thrombin reaction. And at the other end, so it's not prothrombotic, and at the other end, the glutamic acid domain has been cleaved off. So it can't complex with factor five on the platelet membrane to form that prothrombinase complex, because if you had a dummy factor that bound up factor five, it would in effect be an anticoagulant because it would be sweeping all your five out and that five then couldn't interact with your native 10 to, to make thrombin. So it doesn't do either of those, it's inert and it's just a decoy that the 10A inhibitor recognizes and grabs onto. And it keeps, in, and by sweeping that out, uh, inhibitor out of the way, your native tin can function in the clotting cascade. So here again is looking at the different types of drug and what their specific reversal agents are. So for the 10As, the XA bands, patrixaban, apixaban, edoxaban, rubaroxaban. Uh, indexinid alpha is the specific agent, and then for dabigatrin, it's idariucizumab or praxbind. 
so so the the agent formerly known as Indexa, apparently the FDA was pretty strict about what you could call this. So they called it a very descriptive name, which is a recombinant inactivated factor 10A molecule, which is correct, but it doesn't roll off the tongue like Indexa, does it? So we're kind of, I think we'll probably still be calling it IndexNet or Index in the literature. Uh, but if you look on the label, you're probably going to see inactivated, so whatever that is, um, but it's referring to IndexNet. And I do miss Prince, by the way. He died a couple of years ago. And it's very sad. Uh, so the Anexa 4 study design uh, was a single cohort trial. Again, it couldn't really randomize patients uh, to a placebo. And there was major disagreements about what the usual care constituted in the DOAC age. Uh, many different nonspecific agents were used for dabigatrin or the 10A inhibitors, PCCs, FIBA, not even Nova 7 early on. I don't think so much anymore. So what we ended up with um, was kind of like what Winston Churchill said about democracy. It's the worst possible, <laughs> worst possible design except for all the others. Uh, it is a good design. It's, if you had to do a single cohort, this is the way to do it. So you adjudicate entry. You have an independent committee who decides that this patient truly was having a life-threatening hemorrhage that qualified for reversal. So you make sure you're not treating patients who are not sick enough basically. And then you adjudicate outcomes by an independent committee. So that's what we did with Indexinet. We, we uh, enrolled patients with major bleeding uh, who'd taken their 10A inhibitor in the last 18 hours, hoping to capture uh, patients who were truly anticoagulated to test the drug in patients who were bleeding along with being anticoagulated, not just bleeding because they were bleeding. And then also um, there, to get into the efficacy subgroup, you had to have a level of anticoagulant. So this was drawn at the point of care, but obviously we didn't have the result at the point of care. But they were later excluded from efficacy group if their levels were not above a certain amount, 75 nanograms per milliliter to be precise. So there were two doses. Uh, only about 10, a little over 10% of the patients got the higher dose. Um, so it was based on the time from the, again, in the absence of a point of care test to say, this is how anticoagulated this patient is, we had to use time. So if you took it greater than seven hours ago for um, a Pixaban and Rivaroxaban, then you got the low dose. And that was the majority of the patients. There were about 16 Lovenox patients in there. And the patients on Lovenox or Adoxaban or, or very recent Rivaroxaban dose got the higher dose of reversal agent. So the baseline characteristics, uh, this is looking at the safety population. So this is everybody who was enrolled in the trial and got even one cc of indexinet. It's in the safety population. And then to make it into the efficacy population, you had to do, the patient had to, A, have a high enough level to be considered anticoagulated, and B, be adjudicated by the uh, independent academic committee, committee to have truly had a major bleed. And you can see the populations were not that different. There was no cherry picking. Again, safety and efficacy on the side of bleed, not that different between who made it in and who made it through, so to speak. Um, and here's a, so the, the trial had two primary outcomes. And so there was the biomarker, the anti-10A activity level. It's a color metric, turbidometric uh, assay. Uh, in addition to a clinical hemostatic efficacy assessment, which was done, done at, the, at the site, but the primary outcome was adjudicated by the independent committee. So looking at the three different you know, major types of drug, and this is, by the way, based on what was presented at, uh, earlier this year. Um, so it's been presented in abstract form, but the, the full data set hasn't been published yet. So this is beyond the New England Journal publication from 2016. Uh, you can see there's a very sharp drop in antitenic activity um, at the end of bolus, end of infusion, and then uh, it starts to rise back up again at four hours. However, the hemostatic efficacy assessed at 12 hours was actually pretty high. So this compares well with um, the case sent the, the progenitor of this study, the case center studies for warfarin reversal, in which the hemostatic efficacy was actually a little bit lower than that, but uh, 83% excellent or good hemostasis in the uh, 
efficacy group. So this is just breaking down the different, uh, to make sure that we don't have an odd signal in there, pushing one way or another in a subgroup of either the drug or the patient's gender or the type of bleed. And as you can see, this, these force plots are pretty uh, straight line down or slight squiggle, but not, nothing that, that's worrisome about any particular subgroup. <coughs> From bot so safety assessment. So we need to make sure that it works, that it actually reverses the anticoagulant, but we also need to make sure that we're not having an excessive number of thromboembolic events afterwards. Um, that within the first three days, there were six thrombotic events, or 2.6%. Uh, going out to 30 days, there were 11%. Uh, anticoagulation was restarted in 129 or 57% of the patients by 30 days. Um, only nine patients. Of, of the patients who had a thromboembolic event, only nine of them were restarted before that event. And there were 27 deaths for a mortality of 12%. <clears throat> so here's a closer look at the thromboembolic events. So the, the blue line is alive. So if the blue line stops, the patient died. The, um, the events themselves are you can see within the table, strokes, DVTs. And then if they were restarted, you'll see that warfarin apixaban. Uh, and then along the left side, you can see whether they were hemostatic efficacy success or not, been good or excellent or moderate or poor. <clears throat> The other approach, so you can do a factor approach, which is what Indexinet uh, did, or you can do a monoclonal antibody approach to getting an anticoagulant out of the way so that your body can clot again. Idericizumab was the monoclonal antibody approach. And you can see here from dilute thrombin time, which is one of their primary outcomes. Oh, uh, a point here is that Idericizumab was studied in both cohorts, in both major bleeding patients and in urgent surgical patients. Uh, and Dexanet was only studied in major bleeding. <clears throat> so uh, um, make what you will of that. So here's the uh, adericizumab outcomes in terms of dilute thrombin time, which is the best pharmacodynamic marker for uh, uh, direct thrombin inhibitor. And we also can look at, at the bottom two, or the bottom in, in Box C is looking at unbound drug level. So you can see the significant drop after the infusion of five grams uh, sustained out pretty close to 24 hours. And here are the thromboembolic events from the reverse AD idericizumab study. Uh, so here the, the gray line, it's a little different. So the transition from light gray to dark gray is the point of the thromboembolic event. And the red dots are restarting an anticoagulant, those are red diamonds. And the blue dots are restarting of antiplatelet medications, aspirin or Plavix. <clears throat> so a similar number of thromboembolic events, although I believe at 30 days, uh, there's Cizumab had something in the range of 7 or 8% thromboembolic events. Um, but certainly, if you were to throw, and we've done this in a publication, throw confidence intervals around all of the reversal studies, you'll see that the thromboembolic event rates, they all overlap um, and are not statistically significantly different. So important differences, again, reverse AD, adericizumab studied in both major bleeding patients and urgent surgery patients, and Nexafor studied in major bleeding patients. <clears throat> Interestingly, reverse AD was more of a pragmatic study driven by the clinician's decision that this patient needs reversal. And Nexa was more of a control, you know, we had adjud adjudication to get in, adjudication of the efficacy. Uh, we, we got similar types of patients, though, when you look at the Degree, the, the severity of the illness, the percentage of ICH patients, um, that to me just shows that clinicians have sort of decided who really needs to be reversed. 
and, and, and they've that done a good job with in the, in the age of the DOACs of moving that severity up a bit because there's a lot of patients we can just wait and let the, let the body metabolize the drug. <clears throat> uh, an exa, reverse AD, uh, interestingly, at a drug level is the primary outcome as opposed to a clinical assessment. Um, and EXA had, of course, co-primary outcomes, anti-10A levels, and then the 12-hour assessment of hemostatic efficacy. So in the absence of having these specific reversal agents, a lot of other agents have been used. The evidence is not great, but there's some evidence for using PCCs, um, activated PCCs. Not so much FFP. I mean, the, the amount of factor in a CC of FFP is like 0.8. So you'd have to get the equivalent of a PCC dose or even less one of the more, the equivalent of fact of one of these specific reversal agents. You'd be talking about liters and liters of plasma and most of your patients have a fib and you're probably going to throw them in fluid overload, chasing your tail, trying to do something to a DOAC with FFP. I don't think there's a lot of support for doing that. Um, so PCC is, is uh, absent these specific agents. PCC is a reasonable thing to reach for. Uh, which PCC is something else is an entirely separate debate. I mean, in 10A inhibitors, we're trying to replace 10. In direct trauma inhibitors, we're trying to replace 2. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense that a 3 or 4 factor would be superior in replacing one of those two factors. Uh, we don't really have good biomarkers at the bedside to decide who's anticoagulated or not. Uh, we're not, and we're not entirely, as the chest guidance says, we're not entirely sure that the biomarkers we do have correlate very well with patient outcomes. So when it comes to comparing PCC to specific reversal agents, uh, we have some evidence from you know, fairly well done studies, mostly, you know, a collection of centers or single centers looking at applying hemostatic efficacy criteria to patients who got PCC in the period before the, age, the specific agents were approved uh, and looking at the outcomes uh, in, in primarily in ICH or some of these have a collection of ICH and G, unstable GI bleeds, those sorts of things. So this was uh, the Majeed study in blood, 84 patients. Given PCC at a fixed dose, which is pretty common in Canada, uh, less so in the U.S., <clears throat> and it's about 70% ICH and a few GI bleeds in there, and effective hemostasis in 69% um, of patients. So then you say you're looking at the Anexa data or the Darucizumab data, and you're thinking, well, you know, it does something, but it, it's not as good as the, re the specific reversal agent. <clears throat> but then you can look at the... Schulman's analysis of some ICH bleeds uh, in Canada. Granted, it's only 66 patients, 36 of which were ICH, but you look at the difference and you're like, well, well maybe, maybe PCCs. I mean, this is obviously an order of magnitude lower evidence than a, than a prospective FDA regulated trial. They're like, maybe, maybe it's almost as good. And then you come across another trial. This was actually a pretty large database. Of, of neurology centers across Germany, 190 ICH patients finding. So what we're really interested in ICH patients is stopping the hematoma expansion, <clears throat> which is the marker for the patient during, doing poorly. And this fairly large database, they showed no correlation between PCC administration and hematoma. We wanted negative correlation. There was no correlation between PCC administration and hematoma enlargement in these intracerebral hemorrhages seen in neurology departments across uh, Germany. It also had no effect on mortality or functional outcome at discharge or at three months. 190 patients is a lot of ICH patients, but you might not, you might need two or three or four times that many to start seeing these functional outcome changes, uh, which is why many of your stroke studies are so, are so much larger than 200 patients. So how do we interpret our late phase data from adiracizumab and indexinet? And what types of patients should be reversed? How do we best get these agents on the formulary? That's a separate debate. And when 
in the in a situation where we have or sh or may have specific reversal agents, when should we be using PCC? All these are great questions. What do you think, Casey? Uh, well, it would be nice to have uh, some head-to-head -head data comparing uh, the agents against PCC. So short of that, um, I think it's compelling to have a specific agent. And I think um, the use of PCC, I, I don't think there's 100% buy-in from clinicians. I think it's sort of, a, oh, let's give it this and see what happens because we don't have really excellent data to support it in this particular DOAC-treated group who bleeds. Um, so it's compelling data. Um, it looks, they look safe. Uh, they're specific, which I also think uh, lends itself to clinician comfort, great, more so than the PCCs do. Uh, in terms of what patient types should be reversed, I think that's really going to be key uh, in terms of educating physicians um, and really trying to use objective data for hemodynamic instability to make the decision rather than anyone who comes in with a bleed, as you mentioned. Uh, you know, there are a group of patients in whom we can wait. So starting with the uh, traditional, you know, fluids, PRBCs if indicated, and then making that decision um, when we can't reverse the clinical situation. Um, I think a little bit of uh, equipoise is necessary there. Getting these agents on formulary, I mean, that's... Um, That'll be an interesting challenge, as we discussed before, based on cost. But PCC, you know, the K Centro is what we have on ours, and it's not not inexpensive either. Yeah. So cost will probably come up. Uh, and I don't think we have a good cost analysis where we can compare against, you know, PCC or other other um, aspects of cost, such as further resource utilization, as you mentioned before. Um. And then where's PCC? I think PCC is still appropriate for warfarin-treated uh, patients who have major hemorrhage. I don't know yeah. if you you guys have, um, you know, templates at your institution for, you know, which approach is, is preferred sure. in each case. Well, that's one of the nice things about the EMR, and I know everybody likes to trash the EMR. The order sets are very handy for, for helping people remember things that they, especially emergency physicians, where, you know, it's a mile wide. Yeah. The things you see, and you may not see a major bleed on an anticoagulant for six months or a year, and then they come in and you're yeah. trying to remember which yeah. one is which. Uh, so we have order sets in our system for reversing whichever drug. You, know, you can put in the drug or just put in a life-threatening hemorrhage. Um, and if you get one set for warfarin, one set for um, DTIs and Pradaxa, basically Pradaxa, and then one for the 10A inhibitors. And then we could get into a really long debate about antiplatelets, which probably yeah. isn't appropriate for this forum. <laughs> uh, yeah. A lot of disagreement about what to do there.